Okay. Which one are you going to do? <laughs> do you want this one? Or do you want this one? You pick. Oh, she wants a new one. She knows what's up. Going to Best Buy. Hey there, I'm Caleb Logic, and I'm here with my wife, Jen, who is a wedding and portrait photographer. How long have you been doing that, and how many weddings have you shot? Uh, over seven years, and I think we're over 100 weddings at this point. So you've been using the 5D Mark III. We're going to be talking about EOS R and whether it's a good upgrade or side grade from another Canon camera, and if it's well suited for portrait and wedding photography and what she's thought of it. So let's start with the things you liked about it, things I like about it, specifically for photography. What do you think of the camera body? I love how light it is because- It's, it's about half the weight of a 5D3. Sure. It's, it's a lot lighter. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I actually have trigger finger and carpal tunnel, so the fact that the camera is not as heavy and I have to carry it for each 12 hours <laughs> is grip, a big it. deal. Yeah. And grip it all day. Um, I actually prefer the the grip is not as large on this body as it is on that body to me. Like and length? Yes. Or I should say like distance here. Yeah. So I prefer the length of that grip, but I don't think it's something that I couldn't get used to. It's just that camera just melts into my hand at this point. Because you've been using it for so long. Right. So I don't think it would be a deterrent for this body. It's Do you think just, if you had the battery vertical grip, it would be a little better? Maybe, but then wouldn't that just make it heavier yeah, and kind it of, would. yeah. I, I like the lightness of this body. What about the lenses? How they are to use, the focus ring, the clicking, aperture, ISO, stuff like that. Do you like these from what you've used? We've been testing out the 24 to 105, the 50 mil, and the 35 mil, three of the only four lenses that are out for this right, right now. Right, right, right. I really love the 50. The 50 on the Mark III, the 51.2, is my bread and butter. I would say I use that 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a fixed focal length shooter and I shoot shallow, so the 50 is just what I love for my portraiture. Mm -hmm. So it's a very easy swap out, and I do love this lens. Um, it's this that lens. One. That's a perfect I love example. This lens. <laughs> Jen doesn't even look. I hate gear. I hate it. Yeah, so you're not a huge gear person. No. Let's maybe start with that. Um, I'm the person that when a new camera comes out, I'm looking at the specs, I'm watching reviews, I'm getting care. them and testing them. What do you care about then? The image quality, yes. the end product, and then and how, using it? Yes, how does it feel? How easy is it to use? How much do I have to think about it on a wedding day? Because I don't have time to think on a wedding day. Mm -hmm. I just have to compose and move my people and react and there's yeah. no time for messing with my gear. Yeah going into using these lenses compared to these other ones. You said you use the 50 a lot, but you'd live with a 35 all the time on your camera body too, like this. I would say the 35 and the 50 are my lenses. I very rarely swap out for anything else on mm -hmm. a wedding day unless it's a very specific shot. So I, when I was testing this camera, I also was sitting basically on the 50 and the 35, and I was enjoying both of them uh, quite a lot. Did you notice uh, image quality differences or usability or focus or anything different, like specifically about the 50 versus this 50, if someone's trying to compare them? I don't know how to describe this, but to me, the 50 for the EOS felt both sharper and softer, if that okay. makes sense. So I'm a very shallow shooter. I like to be down at one, two all the time, unless I absolutely have to switch out of Which means you miss focus a lot with the 5D3 no, and the 50. I do not miss focus a lot. I do not miss focus a lot. Uh, <laughs> Soft focus, we'll say. No, disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I focus on what exactly what I want to focus on. Okay. Um, and I was very much enjoying the 50 millimeter for the EOS because it's it's a little bit sharper to me than the the 51.2. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, but it's also really buttery and really soft. And I also shoot film. So what do you mean by buttery and soft? Buttery and just, it's, it like feels more. Like the fall more, off of Yeah, the fall off is really is beautiful. Yeah. It feels a bit more textural to me than this 50 does. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, I'm a hybrid shooter, so I shoot medium format film as well. And I really feel like this lens would match film texture better than this one does. What about this lens on this body? What happens? Oh, so so any weight savings you get with the EOS R. Like look at this you, thing. When you're going up to RF lenses like this 50 or the 24 to 105. 24 to 105 is these are pretty comparable, but the 28 but you can to 70. I understand why I thought thought this was the 50 cuz it's the smaller of these two honker right. lenses. Like 
This is huge. And what does it do when you put the lens on? It instantly makes the camera like it's front forward heavy. front yeah, heavy. Yeah, it's lens yeah. heavy, which to me is one of the biggest problems with mirrorless cameras and why I love this 35 mil mm -hmm. so much. This goes down to 1.8, which is low enough, like yeah. two extra clicks to, to one, two is fine. <laughs> um, why I really like this lens is because it's stabilized. And so that's giving you, in video, you can hand hold the camera if you want to instead of having it jitter, but also you're getting more stops of stabilization. So you could shoot at 1 30th or 1 15th or something mm -hmm. even at nighttime or receptions or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the stabilization of this lens is gonna make it so that photo is still clear. Do you know what this lens also does, which is kick ass? What? It macros. So you have a 35 mil macro. This to me is my favorite lens they came out with. It's so cool. And it's, it's the cheapest one too. Really? I, See. So if if they came out with a bunch of these RF lenses, these mid-tier 500-ish dollar lenses that don't go down to one, two, or aren't this like crazy scientific exploration from the Canon lens team, but they're this size, this is why I would go mirrorless. Because yeah. these things I could toss to you, they're lighter, they're like a baseball in weight versus the heft of this thing. And it's not just in your hands and holding it. And I do like the feel of a bigger DSLR camera compared to a mirrorless. Like this feels more pro. Like it if you drop it, it, you're going to break. More the, pro. You're going to break the thing it lands on. Yeah, which like on your a foot. <laughs> or if you, I haven't done that yet. You have dropped lenses and kicked them down the no, street, no, no. though. I have thrown them down okay. parking garage. Uh, throwing is levels. better than kicking. Well, I didn't mean to throw it. I was gesturing, and it came out of my hand. It's fine, it's here. But if you have this around your neck or on your hip in a holster like you do, it's heavier, it's weighing you down more. Right, and here's here's the thing. I love the weight of the Mark III. I love how it's balanced. I love the size of it. I love that it looks like a pro camera because very often on a wedding day, you as the photographer are not the only one there with a the camera. So when you look like you have the pro camera, then people are giving way to you mm -hmm. versus Uncle Bob and his yeah. DSLR. Um, but over years of use and you know eight to 12 hour days with a camera the like lighter weight is a big deal it's a really big deal so while my heart really loves the mark three or the mark four i can be talked into this and this lens was good enough for you like the pictures that came out of this were That's, crisps and cr right. like i could have said this was l series or had a red ring and you wouldn't have known the difference Based no, on this, the images this you is took. a beautiful lens. It's just 35 is not my my preferred focal length, mm -hmm. so I tend to sit on the 50 just because that's kind of how my eye sees things. Mm -hmm. um, but I really I loved this lens. Shooting in manual mode like you do for film, I know you usually shoot in AV when you're more run and gun and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, just quicker. But using this and being being on a mirrorless with the electronic viewfinder, talk about the difference there. So. This being an optical viewfinder, I know you know, an optical viewfinder, you look through it and you see what your eye sees when you're not having it up to your eye. The electronic viewfinder is basically looking at your LCD screen like in live view, but up to the eye. So why have you liked that? And what has it enabled you to do basically? Like... Why have I liked the... Having a mirrorless camera with electronic viewfinder. Yeah. I love the electronic... The electronic... One more time. <laughs> what do you love? I love the electronic viewfinder because I have trouble seeing when it's really dim. You and I actually get into sparring matches over this because... Or if it's really bright, though. I Yeah, actually, so have, I have no dynamic range. You have blue range eyes. Yeah. yeah, you have blue <laughs> eyes, so when it's sunny out, it's hard for you to see. Yes. You have to have really dark sunglasses. Yes. When it's dim, it's hard for you to see. Yes. You need more light. Yes. So when you're outside taking photos during the day or even at night, the EVF lets you see better? or how does Absolutely. It work? I can see far better with the EVF than I can through either my Mark III or my medium format body when I'm just seeing, you know, what is what's the technical term like what's there? optical yeah. optical um so i like the brightness of the screen as you're looking through the viewfinder and it it allows me to really know that my stuff is in focus image review is one thing you can use it for where 
when you're outside and you don't have your LCD turned up all the way and you're trying to you know cover it and see what your photo was, you can just take your photo, review it in here. That's one perk. Um, and I will say that I didn't know that you could turn the image review off in the viewfinder. So I was getting really frustrated because every time I took a photo, it would stay, it would stay there and there would be this lag in between. Before you can take your next photo. Right. Before, and I was getting so frustrated. And then, of course, I hand you the camera and you're like, oh, just turn it off. And it's on I'm page 74 of the manual. You just have to. <laughs> yeah. But after that went away, I was fine. What about, so you usually shoot film as yes. well. And that's completely manual. You're using a light meter. You're dialing in your settings. You're a little bit slower and calmer versus shooting with a 5D. And you're sometimes shooting in manual, usually shooting in AV, letting it do like the shutter calculation and stuff mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. um, were you more likely to shoot in manual mode with this because you knew what you were going to get in the electronic viewfinder? A little bit more, yeah, actually, because I could see the live preview of what the image was going to look like. Um, I will say that my muscle memory on this isn't great yet, so I wasn't as quickly able to toggle as I am on this body, but because, I could see getting there. Because what's different is really this control wheel and this wheel on a 5D are your aperture and shutter, yes. depending on who, which your preference is. And on here, what you have is you have your aperture and shutter, but it's here instead. It's that and slight That's more difference. like a, this is more like a film camera, like an old school film camera or yes. Fuji cameras have this. And so your dials are up here instead of down here on a wheel. Yes. Which this is, you can go really quick, I feel like, with but a wheel. That but that is huge. Like the thumb difference and the movement between down here and up here when you're working as fast as you have to work as a wedding photographer, that's huge. That's that's a huge mus so you, muscle memory shift. You prefer the wheel I prefer down here. I prefer it down here, but I also prefer it down here because I have carpal tunnel. It, this so reach is up. more difficult for me. Yeah. And then what about having, you know, a third ring? Was that helpful on the lenses to have that third ring for changing ISO, or did you never use it? What did the third ring do? So, I didn't know there was. <laughs> so there's a focus ring, and then there's a That's third ring. That's what I did. I'm, I know I changed my ISO somehow while I was shooting. You don't know I had how. no idea. And it just cranked and it was ridiculously bright. And I brought it back down, I think with the screen, but I hit the ring. Yeah. Dang. So all the new RF lenses have this extra control ring. So you have, I mean, zoom, focus, control. So that's this actually too much for my brain, wedding photography wise. Like, I need, I, if I hit the okay. wrong ring in the wrong moment, that's okay. a no-go for okay. me. Okay, but this is a fixed lens, which is you normally, what you normally use. Right. This one would be ISO. So essentially, let's put it together. So if you have it all set up, you would have, let's say, aperture, shutter, ISO. So you have full manual control right here with your yeah, three fingers. Yeah, I'd be into that. And you, you didn't know that. I didn't know that. You were also shooting mostly in a controlled environment. Yes, I was not shooting. When we tested it, you were using wedding. flash it's for one of them. Season, so I'm, yeah, I'm shooting uh, yeah. more controlled things right now. But yeah, getting back to the ergonomics of this, I do think that whatever next iteration of this camera is going to be is going to be better for you. Like this to me is still a mid-range it's, it's not pro. It's like an advanced ADD. Yeah. If you look at if you look at the ADD, it's almost the exact same size. And this is twenty three hundred dollars. And these are usually like twelve, thirteen hundred when they launch. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it's it's set up very similarly. Where this does have a control wheel. Don't know why they got rid of it here. Um, your buttons are pretty similar. You don't have the four buttons that a five D usually has around the top to to use menu. So I don't know. To me, what Canon's going to do next is they're going to come out with a camera that's this size, mm -hmm. that's mirrorless, mm -hmm. that has some of these things that you want and hopefully get rid of things like this that you didn't use at all. I have no idea what that does. Honestly, you can set it up to do some things, but in my experience, it's not really that useful. Um, you can swipe or have it set to two different things. So you could change autofocus or change your ISO or other different things you can change it to. But honestly, I didn't end up using, using it, it much, uh, even when I tried to set it to things that I thought I'd really use. Yeah. I will say one thing that was really nice 
coming from the Mark III and starting to use the EOS R was the flip out screen and the touch screen. That was something completely foreign to me that I really enjoyed getting to know. So like an ADD having the flip out screen, what did you use it for? mainly? I mainly used it for top down shots. So I set up a lot of flat lays in what I'm shooting and I have to get that perfect perpendicular or parallel, who knows, angle <laughs> over the, the, basically the scene that I've set up. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to do sometimes depending on where you're shooting and what you're shooting and do you need a stool or do you need to like lower what you're shooting. So it was really nice to be able to just reach the camera out over what turn you were shooting, screen. turn the screen and touch the screen to fire. It kind of felt like shooting with a really glamorous iPhone. Um, like it just made it easier versus sometimes taking blind photos if you can't get into the right spot. Or blind or setting up like or a using tripod live over view and trying or, to do like this thing, yeah, or just like bending the hell out of your hamstrings to get over. <laughs> yeah, but to get over. but basically going like this and doing the flat lay like yeah. that, or stabilizing it and going like touch, right. and it would just immediately take a focus yeah. or a focus shot. That was really nice, I think, to to see you be able to do that instead of the contorting your body. You're trying to do something weird. Absolutely. So so that is absolutely a nice feature. What did you think about? The fact that because you don't have a joystick on here, moving focus points, and I know that that was one thing that going from this and using a joystick, moving focus points to exactly where you want it, focus recomposing, like that's how you shoot normally. Yes. Um, going from that to either trying to do that with this, with using the touch screen and dragging your thumb around like a joystick, or starting to trust that the camera can track stuff. I hated it. You hated the... the I hated it. Okay, so what was the first reason why I hated it? The first reason why I hated it was because of um, my wrist, honestly. Okay. The extension across the screen to get the focal point to where I wanted it to be, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just, it was too painful. Okay. Yeah. So reaching your thumb across like this to basically yeah. use the left or the right side of the screen. Right, because on the Mark III, my wheel is down here. So I'm not I'm your not here, I'm, your doing, I'm not here. doing any extension. You're not going like so this I'm the, to the move reach it. over. Okay. And then what's up with your eyes? Why? <laughs> I knew you were gonna bring this. Okay, up. so hold this up like you would normally take a photo. <sighs> like into the camera? Well, anywhere. That's fine. Just, yeah, hold it okay, up. Okay, so I'm a left eye shooter. Because you can't close. Because I can't close my left eye. Like you can't. Like I can do this. I can't. Versus, like, like I would just do this. Am, am I doing it? I don't think so. I, li I literally cannot of my own. Leave your right eye open and close your left eye. Did I do it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> So, so because of that, I have to shoot with my left eye and my nose kept bumping the screen and thinking it was your finger and thinking and it was my finger trying to refocus. And I was getting so frustrated, so frustrated. So I actually, I don't know, did I use single point focus and then I just started recomposing mm -hmm. and that's how I got to a happy place. Yeah. With One it. thing we did was you can change it so that the left side of the screen is the touch control. So that was one thing we, we did yeah. where you went up to here and instead of trying to use your right hand that's injured to reach across, you would use your left thumb here. And I do think that would be a viable option going forward yeah. if we were to get this camera. It would just require a lot of retraining of my brain. Because of ten or hundreds of thousands of photos being right. taken with this. Yeah, yeah. so it, it would be doable. So you would go left eye like you're in TLC and do this. Sorry, it was, really, it was a really good joke. Um, the other thing with doing that, though, was that you wanted to keep using that mode because you're used to having a focus point, locking on in single shot, and recomposing. Yes. But I started having you use servo way more with this camera, and also you would just set up the single point in the middle lock onto things, those things would move, you would move in and out, forward and back. Which, here's my thing with that. Yeah. If I'm gonna shoot servo and trust my camera, which I have had issues with in the past when you give me new pieces of gear that you say can face track or do whatever, um, 
I'm okay with that if it's a scenario where, say, the bride and groom just kissed and they're coming down the aisle and I'm in servo with face tracking on their faces or his face or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Because to me, that's a wider shot. It's not going to matter if the exact thing, like it's not gonna miss their face. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing portraiture and I'm shooting shallow and I want their eye in focus, not their nose or their eyebrow or mm -hmm. their eyelashes or whatever, I feel like I'm, I'm skilled in doing that on the Mark III. Mm -hmm. And I was having difficulty with this camera doing that. When it was in servo? When it was in servo. So when it's in servo, which means it's gonna continually autofocus based on what it's locked on to or right. where the focus point is or kind of where that thing moves or if you move in and out, it does, you, you kind of have to just trust that it's gonna grab the thing that you want it to grab onto sometimes. And if that's a face and you're really shallow, you might not get and that's what my you thing. want like, I'm a portrait photographer and there are layers to someone's face. So but if you just face tracking yeah. them is not enough for me. Like I need to be able to say like, I want their pupil in focus mm -hmm. or I want their, you know, eyelashes in focus yeah. or like I have to get that specific with it. And one thing that this does have is it is one of the first, if not the first, Canon cameras that has eye tracking. Which was great. I in, loved But that. only in single shot. Right. It was only in single shot and it was only within a certain distance from my subject. So I could only and use you, it. you wanted it to be a little further. Right. Because I'm... For the most part, I am always seeking someone's eye for what's in focus. As soon as I backed up a certain distance, that eye box went away, and then it was just the face. And if you're shooting shallow enough, and I'm if and I'm a sh shallow shooter, so as soon as, as soon as what I want is not clearly in focus, mm -hmm. then I'm technically missing focus, even though yeah. I might not be yeah. because their face is perfectly in focus. So, did you like the eye tracking on this, or you kind of gave up on it? I liked it, but I also kind of gave up on it just because I do really enjoy shooting in like single shot mode and I enjoy controlling where the focus point is. So what I ended up doing was just reverting to that and doing a lot of recomposing. What was your experience using the, the lens adapter ring and putting a older lens, you know, a, an EF lens or even, you know, like an EFS lens on there? It was fine. Was it focusing as fast as these lenses or maybe a little slower? Uh, I felt like it was just as fast. It may have been slower, but I don't pay attention to that so kind like of, like it wasn't hindering, yeah, yeah, it was not hindering my productivity as a shooter. And so if we got this, if we got an EOS R, would you jump for any of these lenses? Or because we have a 50 mil L series and we have a 35 mil L series, and an 85, and a 100, and a 135, and a 24 to 105, like any of the lenses that are out other than maybe the 28 to 70 that we haven't tried. Um, this to me would be the only one that I would buy yeah. to start. If I already had a 24 to 105 and a 50 mil, I would just adapt them. I think I would too. I, I mean, as much as I loved the 50, I, I think it would be just kind of a self-indulgent decadent purchase because I mean, that's we like have, $2, right, we have a 50 that I love and that's beautiful and a really great piece of glass. Mm -hmm. But this one, making this a smaller, more portable, like for travel. Yeah, or, travel would be amazing. Or like just everyday kind of shooting. This combo, the EOS R and the new 35 mil, I think this is great. Yeah, for under, I agree. For under 3000 having a good, solid mirrorless Canon camera that also mm -hmm. can adapt to all the other gear that we've already invested ourselves mm -hmm. into, I think would be worth it. And if they came out with more RF lenses in the foreseeable future of different focal lengths, I would be trying to convince you to get those too. Trying, being the cute And failing. <laughs> so I don't think there were any deal breakers so far as we've talked about it, really just things that annoyed you, like your nose touching the screen and this yeah. track bar and like, if you switch to this camera, would you make do? Oh, absolutely. I think I'm just a curmudgeon. I'm used to what I'm used to. And so it's switching to a new piece of gear and having to not relearn, but just kind of adjust my behavior a little bit. Yeah. 
can I tell you other things about it that might make you not want to use it? Sure. Okay, so it only has one <laughs> one SD card slot. Out. I'm done. For weddings? Yeah. You'd be out. Uh -huh. What uh -huh. about for other stuff? Portraits um, and other stuff. Stock like if I'm if I'm tethering and, and I'm able to both have images. the card and be shooting to either my desktop or a hard drive, that would be enough. So wedding um, just no. Not worth it's not responsible to not shoot on two cards mm -hmm. as a wedding photographer, no. Okay. Um, what about this mode dial at the top? Did you use it at all? No, I don't think you used it I at didn't, all. I didn't use so it. basically your mode dial being here on the five D series, switching manual A V, you'd hit mode here and rotate it. Oh uh, yeah. that's but, clever. But you kept it in manual most yeah. of the time. So didn't really need to use that much. Um, what else is weird about this camera? You also really hated the the back caps on the lenses. Why? This is ridiculous. Okay, so it, no, it I I get upset talking about this. I do not have time to match the the flipping like things up to get this cap on. Like I'm doing things. This just needs to go on no matter how I twist it on. Okay, so just like doing a little bit of looking, the the older caps. There are three different grooves that I can go in. So you only have to turn this at most a third. Right. Like 120 degrees. Yes. You would have to turn it to, to catch it and then close it. This This was infuriating. It looks like there's three grooves. But there's not. There's only the one. The liar. So you have the lying lens. Yeah, you have to line up the exact lines and then turn it. You can't, there's no, no one other has wear. time for this. It's infuriating. No, I would get into trouble because you're Mr. Gear and I, like I just wouldn't put up with this. So I would like get no. rid of and put this in my bag and just go and, and then I get home yeah. and you'd be like, what, what, what is up Where's with lens this? Cap? One, one? And I, I don't know where the lens cap is. It's probably in a parking garage somewhere. Hey! You do have <laughs> <laughs> wow. And also, you used this with flashes, which... I did. That was fun to try to figure out, actually, because that uh, bamboozled me for a hot second. Yeah, I needed so help from you on that. We were using uh, flashes from a brand called Impact, and they had their own little hot shoe yeah. adapter that didn't tell the EOS R that it should be in kind of flash mode, which when you're using an electronic viewfinder, matters because we're in a really dark space. Really dark space. And so because you have your, you're in manual mode, you have your shutter down to 125, 1 over 125, your ISO's at 100 yeah. or something. So you're looking through electronic viewfinder. And it's black. It's black. It's completely There's dark. To There's nothing on. to see. And using that third party trigger didn't tell the Canon camera that it needed to compensate with ISO in the preview of right. the electronic viewfinder to take the photo. Um, I don't know if that was the best way to explain it, but I think I explained it. <laughs> and so the workaround was we had to put a Canon flash on top of this and then put the bigger flashes in slave mode. Right. So when your Canon flash would flash, they would trigger. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this is just something we didn't know how to figure out or it's a firmware thing or the comments below can tell us how dumb we are, but it's not something we were able to do, so you had to basically use a Canon trigger or a Canon flash to talk to the to talk yeah. to the other third-party flashes in slave mode versus just putting on that third-party. Right when I shoot with my Mark III, I just put the third-party. It's like this shoe big. In, yeah, it's and, lighter yeah. versus putting a big flash, which like again, the 430 or the 600. I'm looking Canons. to yeah. take weight off of my wrist while I'm shooting, so I've got this itty bitty little trigger on top, and so when we had to put the big old honkin flash on to talk to the yeah. other that made my so maybe there's a way we could have figured it out to use a third party adapter Probably. still but once we put on the canon flash something i didn't change any settings something about the camera was like "Ooh, this is a canon flash i better give you a better live preview it's magic in the electronic viewfinder so you can see what you would take a picture of but it's not in that kind of mode it's not telling you what you would actually see when the flashes fire mm-hmm because it, I don't even know how it would figure that out. So, flashes. I have a love for that. I don't spend time worrying about how to figure stuff out. You just asked me to do it? Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we talked about how we would 
keep the EOS R that we have on loan from B&H here for a few weeks to just test it out and to do this review and to just try it really. We talked about how if we did get an EOS R, we would just use an adapter in all of our existing lenses and then maybe buy the 35. But if we were to sell our 5D3s, would you get this or would you just get a 5D Mark IV? A 5D Mark IV right now is about $400 more than this camera. Would you stick with a DSLR with the bigger body, get the touch screen, the more megapixels that this has, but not have the flip out screen, not have electronic viewfinder, not be able to use new lenses, what would you do? I honestly don't know. I could be talked into into either. I I love the Mark III and I know the Mark IV is just the next version of that, so I know that I would love that camera. I really did enjoy the electronic viewfinder in this. I enjoyed how much lighter it was and I did enjoy the touch to fire touch screen um, because I I'm not only doing weddings, but I'm shooting differently and shooting tethered, and I'm doing a lot of top-down stuff right now. So that really, like, physically saved me um, from having to lean over for mm -hmm. six hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I kind of don't care. You don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> I I love Canon stuff, and. I just have to, whether it's the Mark IV or whether it's this camera, there will be some slight modifications to the way that I shoot, and I would just have to get comfortable with those. So right now, are we going to sell both our 5D3s and switch to this? Could we go on a trip instead? <laughs> we could sell them and go on a trip, yeah. Would you professionally sell these and change this? I would honestly have to do more more with this camera to be confident in switching. I haven't shot in low light. I haven't shot a reception. I haven't done some of the things that are my bread and butter. So I would need more time with this camera to commit to it. So right now we wait. Right now we would wait. So we're going to wait. But we already have two cameras that work that are great. We will upgrade at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the decision is different, though, if you don't have anything at all or if you're coming up from kind like of a, a, a 70 yeah. or 80D or something like that or a T6i or something and you want to get a more professional So And camera. our friends do that all the time with you. They, what camera should I buy? What camera should I buy? And it's not even what camera should I buy. Sometimes it's I've got this, like I want to upgrade. What I usually tell you... them no, but <laughs> I usually say like what you have is good enough. Maybe put money into better lenses right. or audio right, or right. lighting if you're doing video. Like, but say you're talking to another gearhead and mm -hmm. they're they're ready for the next version. Like, are are you put are you suggesting a Mark IV? Are you suggesting the EOS? Mm. EOS R. EOS R. It's a, it's a dumb name. It's fine. <laughs> They should have called it like unicorn Wally. Um, or Wally. Yeah. No, but we've got friends that have this camera, mm -hmm. and maybe they're gearheads and they want to bump into the next one. What would you tell them when they're looking for their next step up in cameras? I think if you have something that's uh, below a 5D series, so if you have a 6D or an 80D or a 70D or a T6I or something like that, and you're trying to go into a more professional camera body and you're not taking photographs of things like weddings that only happen once, that if you have a card failure, you won't lose something that cannot ever happen again, I think this is a great camera. I think this is an amazing camera for hobbyists as well as people that are trying to get into professional or are professional and maybe they want a B camera or something. Like if you have a 5D and you want a smaller body for travel or just you want to start using mirrorless and stuff like that, this is a great camera. I've really enjoyed using it. I like that you can adapt all of your other Canon lenses for no problem. Like you can't even put EFS lenses on 5D series because of the mount being different. I like that you can use all of the lenses in all the different ways for photography. But I personally, I'm gonna wait. Like I, I like a lot of stuff about this. I like it being Canon's first full frame mirrorless camera and it has a lot of potential to me. Um, I do think some of the usability of the track bar on the back 
not having a wheel here or a joystick or something. Um, to me, it just, this is harder to use and I don't end up using a lot of the things that they've kind of thrown into this camera. But I know whatever the next one is, that would probably be the one that will make us jump. Yeah, I think our consideration would be more the Mark IV and the like the pro version of their mirrorless. I think that would be where our needs would lie. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to go two full cycles because 5D3, we got it in 2012. I think the 5D4 came out in 2016 maybe. Yeah. So it's about halfway through its cycle. But I do think Canon might stop making 5Ds entirely and just make mirrorless versions of this within the next six to 12 months or so. So to me, I think we wait, keep using these a little bit longer, and then when a $3,000, $4,000 version of this one comes out that's a little bit more pro and robust, then that's when we make the switch. Deal. <laughs> It's a no deal. And if you're somehow still watching this and you don't own any Canon stuff, there are plenty of other good cameras out there, Fuji, Sony, Nikon, whatever. I would just get the cameras in hand, go to a photo store nearby or B&H if you're in New York or Best Buy or whatever, borrow them, maybe rent them. I rent from LensPro to go all the time, just like see if I wanna use a, a camera or buy it. Get your hands on whatever it is, test it out, because like this, borrowing this, trying it in real world stuff, that's when you actually figure out if something is going to work for you, not just watching YouTube videos. So thanks for joining me, Jen. Anytime. Really anytime, next video? Sure. What, you, what? I can talk about all the gear things. Clearly. Yeah, I'm. Clearly. I speak gear. Very well. Very well, what's, fluent. What's uh, this thing called? This is the um, shoehorn. Hot shoe. Hot shoe. You were close. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching everyone. See you there.